welcome and you are going to be glad you are here starting this very moment. Welcome to the Center for Brain Health, Frontiers of Brain Health, where we bring the greatest discoveries and emerging scientists to bring the public, scientists and students up to speed on some of the most cutting edge discoveries. And we certainly have one of those with you today. I think, Dr. Pearl, we have been wanting to come for a very long time, a very prominent scientist, and we're very fortunate to have you. My name is Dr. Sandy Chapman. I'm the founder and chief director of the Center for Brain Health. The term brain health is so new, 25 years ago, I actually got a trademark on it because people were not thinking about their brain in health. We hope every single person, we can do the rigorous science to say what does that mean to keep your brain healthier, stronger, faster, regardless of where you start, what education, what walk of life you're in. And we're excited to have collaborators. If people are doing strong science somewhere else, we ask them to collaborate with us because we are very much open to doing the most meaningful collaborations to reach the most people. There will be a few minutes, uh, as, as many of you know, to have questions. If you're online virtually, use the Q&A code. If you are here in person, raise your hand, and I hope that we will have a lot of time for questions because I know you're going to ask him, but he's got a lot of information to share. This will be recorded, and so you'll be able to share it with other scientists as well. Let me now introduce Dr. Daniel Pearl. And what I'm so excited about is one of the initiatives here at the Center for Brain Health is optimal brain health for warfighters. We want to bring brain health to every single military from the very beginning of their career throughout their life, through whatever transition they're going through. And so knowing sort of what can happen is very important for us to be more proactive, more excited, and, and make it much more prominent. And we will share more about what optimal brain health is for warfighters. Dr. Daniel Pearl is truly, truly one of the nation's most respected doctors, scientists, for his work in all sorts of aspects of neuropathology of age-related neurodegenerative disorders. I first learned about him with his environmental work of toxic factors in the complex thing that was happening in the native population of Guam. He was on the front of many scientific journals and newspapers for that work and we all know that our environment impacts our brain. He is also very well known as a medical educator and you'll see he a storyteller and loves to share sort of case studies that can really make the science come alive. In September 2010, he joined the faculty of the Department of Defense's Uniformed Services University of Health Science, uh, which is, we call USIS. I was always like, it was hard for me to remember what all USIS stood for. But he, it's in conjunction with the congressionally mandated center for Neuroscience and Regenerative Medicine. Dr. Pearl is really leading the way for us to understand the neuropathology in our military that's very different from our athletes and the, the type of injuries that we hear. He's changing the conversation. He's changing the way we approach it. His work is so important that everyone needs to hear this, and it is a, a resounding bell for us to do something starting much earlier in the career so we don't have this happen. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Daniel Pearl. Well, thank you very much, Sandy, for that gracious introduction. And I'm really happy to be here. And I've heard a great deal about this center and what it does, and it's really a great pleasure for me to be here and actually see how you do it uh, and, and meet with many of your people. So thank you for coming. So we're going to talk about military TBI. Uh, and before I start, I'm required to tell you that I'm a federal employee, and these are my own opinions, not necessarily those in the federal government. Hopefully they agree with me, but we, we won't go there and I have no conflicts to report. So, starting out, 
I want you all to recognize that there are two kinds of TBI, impact and blast. Okay? And what we normally think about in terms of traumatic brain injury is impact TBI, hitting your head, whether it's uh, a fall, a fight, playing football or soccer, etc. Blast TBI is an interaction with high explosives. Right? It's different. And uh, impact TBI is very common in the civilian community, so and it has been forever, really. Uh, and so we know a lot about it. It's been extensively studied. We know a lot about the pathology and about the uh, the uh, effects on the brain of impact TBI, the long-term effects. It's been studied really ex extensively, and it's well known throughout the medical community and the neuroscience community. Now, blast TBI is related to interaction with blast. And we'll talk about what that means in a minute. But this is not seen in the civilian community. And so as I'll try to point out to you, it has hardly been studied at all. And so when I began with this work, we really had very little to go on. All right. So let's talk about blast TBI. Blast TBI is related to interaction with what's called the blast wave or blast overpressure. And when a high explosive uh, is detonated, it gives out a wave of high pressure, very short, uh, about 10 milliseconds in duration, that spreads out in all directions at about the speed of sound. And you can see in these slow motion pictures the blast wave expanding out. Here's the blast wave interface. We'll do it again. Oh, that's too quick. Okay, there, there's the blast wave going out. And again, this spreads, all right? Now, the blast wave penetrates the intact skull, passes through the brain, okay? Uh, and the question is, what is that phenomenon of a pressure wave passing through the most complex and uh, important organ of the body due to its structure and its function. Okay? This is a, this is a pressure wave that is, can be strong enough to break windows a quarter of a mile away. All right? But it's passing through the brain. All right? uh, and we do know that people who've been exposed to blast uh, not uncommonly they don't all do it, but not uncommonly suffer from persistent neuropsychiatric sequelae, right? In other words, they don't go away. Uh, it's not a temporary thing. And these are physical, cognitive, and behavioral emotional, and include headaches, nausea, vomiting, blurred vision, sleep disturbance, very common, very disruptive to everyday life, um, sensitivity to light and noise, balance problems, hearing problems, uh, et cetera. In, term, in the cognitive area, impaired attention and concentration, recent memory problems, speed of processing thoughts, uh, issues with executive function. And then on the behavioral side, we see periods of depression, anxiety, agitation, irritability, impulsivity, aggression, impaired judgment, et cetera. Okay? So all these things can be seen in people who've been exposed to blast. Now, that's a, that's a nice description in, in words, but I'd like to show you what this looks like, okay? Some of, some of you may, have, may know the people that I'm gonna uh, show here, but for many of you, I think it's, a, it's instructive to see this. And I hope the, hmm, we don't have sound. And this doesn't work without sound. <laughs> okay. These are three former Navy SEALs. This is a video that was produced by the Navy SEAL Foundation and shared with me. Do we have it now? Let's try it. outlook on 
things was my brain is damaged if I can't think anymore. How am I going to continue to contribute and not put other guys at risk if I can't problem solve? And at this point, I was a team leader, you know, so even more responsibility for others. I finally got to a point where I was like, let me just stop the decline. Throughout your career, it doesn't matter whether you've experienced combat or not, you're all, everyone's exposed to, you know, a number of blasts. You're, you're firing giant weapons all the time. You're, you know, blowing open doors, breaching doors. All of that stuff affects you in one way or the other. One of the uh, things that stuck out to me when I knew that I couldn't solve problems anymore, I was moving into a new house and I had to figure out how to put blinds in the house. And I had it all written down in my team guide folder and my notebook, and it was, you need six of these and seven of those. And I went with my daughter, Evan, and Olivia, and I had it, and I had it all in the, in the, in the cart. And I couldn't figure it out. I could not figure out how many I had, even, even though I was, I was like, okay. And I'm counting each one, and, and I counted it, right? And then I look back at it and I look at my paper and say, well, something's missing. So and then I picked up another group and I put it back and forth 10 times. Same thing, same number, same everything. And my daughter Evan just looked at me and said, oh, she's like, Dad, are you okay? And I was like, I can't figure this out. <laughs> she's 12 and she figured it out. And at that point, I'm like, God, I can't. And she even said, um, do you need to see somebody? And coming from a 12 year old, my 10 year old, they're just looking at me like, man, he used to be able to do everything. When I say I couldn't figure it out, I could not figure it out. <coughs> I couldn't. I had absolutely no capacity to solve that problem. So what's going on here? Oh my God, these are top performers who are complaining of this this sort of problem, and there are many others I could show you. Okay, so what do we know about the acute and long-term effects on the human brain of exposure to a high explosive, like an IED or suicide bomb, etc.? Okay, what do we know about it? You would think that that question had been extensively researched and that we can answer it in detail. The prototype high explosive is TNT. TNT was synth first synthesized in 1863 as a yellow dye in the German dye industry. And actually for 30 years, they didn't even know it was an explosive because it's difficult to detonate, all right? But once they figured that out, they realized that it gave off a tremendous amount of, of energy very rapidly, and that was the entry into the whole concept of a high explosive. It was first put into military service in 1902 when TNT was put into the core of artillery shells. But this really got going in the experience in World War I. And in World War I, this, uh, as you probably know, evolved into trench warfare where they dug into trenches and essentially just stayed in those trenches and exchanged uh, large numbers of shells containing high explosives. Both sides had them, and they just, that's what they did. So one of the, you know, uh, classic battles of World War I was the Battle of Verdun from February to December of 1916. And in that 10-month period, 40 million high explosive artillery shells were exchanged. 40 million, okay? And we're not talking about small shells. You can see them at the bottom there in the middle picture. That's what they looked like, okay? 1,000 to 2,000 pound shells back and forth and back and forth. Uh, total casualties is estimated in half a million with 300,000 deaths. 70% of the casualties were caused by the effects of these explosions. Okay? And many of the deaths occurred in the vicinity of an artillery blast, yet with no overt sign of injury to the body or to the head. Okay? Now, deployed at that time was a, a, a pathologist, actually, 
Dr. Frederick Mott, who was a major in the, in the military. You can see him here on the right. And this is, this is a blow up of that, okay? And he got interested in why are these guys dying? What's going on here? Um, and was invited to give a very famous lecture that has been written up in the Lancet uh, on the effects of high explosives upon the central nervous system. He was interested in the central nervous system and what, what's the effect on the brain. So this is where it starts, okay? And in this paper and a subsequent book he wrote, he describes three brains of three subjects he describes that there are focal hemorrhages in these brains and never looked at them under the microscope. That was it, okay? Subsequently in World War II, there's a single paper reporting 11 cases of people exposed to high explosives who developed hemorrhage in the brain. Again, no microscopic description of those cases. That was it. Okay. Now, clinically, in the trenches, a large number of individuals would develop a syndrome with persistent behavioral features that interfered with their being on the battlefield. You couldn't keep them in the trenches. They couldn't keep them in the battlefield, and they were removed to the, to the, uh, be beyond the lines of engagement in these tents. In each one of these tents, would have 10 to 12 people being evaluated. Uh, and most of these patients were categorized as having what they called DY, uh, NYDN, or not yet diagnosed nervous, neurasthenia, or simply shell shock. Okay? Well, what was shell shock? Well, there was no accepted clinical definition of shell shock, but one study said that 60% of them had been concussed. And the clinical symptoms included persistent headaches, poor concentration, amnesia, difficulty sleeping, abrupt mood swings, impulsive acts, and not infrequently suicide. Sounds familiar, okay? All right, so World War I is over. At least in Britain, all of these shell shock victims, again, couldn't be kept kept there, um, and they were, they were shipped home. And they were shipped home to be evaluated in one of two hospitals. One was called the Maudsley Hospital outside of, of London. It's still there. Uh, the Maudsley Hospital was staffed by neurologists. Indeed, the director of the Maudsley Hospital was none other than Dr. Maud. Okay? Uh, and he staffed this hospital with neurologists, and they considered shell shock to be an organic or neurologic disease related to damage to the brain by the blast exposure. The other hospital was the Maco Hospital outside of Liverpool. That was staffed by psychiatrists. This was at the time when psychiatry and neurology were splitting off. They had been together and they were splitting off, okay? They looked at these cases and said, no, 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 no. This is a functional psychiatric disorder, a psychoneurosis related to emotional disturbances, repressed memories, etc." Okay. So, you had over 100,000 individuals. Every, every city and town in, in England had numerous examples of this, people walking around in the streets. Uh, many of them were homeless. They couldn't work, and the question was, what were you going to do with them all? Were you going to pension them? Were you going to support them financially? Okay. Well, England's economy was decimated by World War I, and they couldn't afford to do this. Okay. So they, they, they put together a committee called the Southborough Committee, and they studied this, and in 1922, issued a report. It's 200 pages. If you're really interested in this, you can find it online and read it, okay? Um, so let me show you some of the things that are in this report. Shell shock was to be considered a convenient invasion of duty, if not disguised malingering. 
No case of psychoneurosis or of mental breakdown, even when attributed to a shell explosion or the effects thereof, should be classified as a battle casualty. Shell shock was not a valid diagnostic entity, and the use of the term should therefore be banned. Okay? So, in the history, we have World War I, we have shell shock, we have the mag hall and the, and, uh, the Morsley psychiatry versus neurology with the Southboro report. Ne the neurology aspect of this has been uh, removed. This is no longer a disease we can, uh, a disease entity we can refer to. So what happens? Well, as history goes on, we got to World War II, we got to Vietnam, we can't use, and we see the same thing in about the same percentage, okay? Uh, and you can't use the term shell shock anymore, it's been banned. So we get, need a new term, so we call it battle fatigue or combat fatigue. Same exact thing. And then we get to Vietnam. And in Vietnam it's a little different because we now have psychiatrists who are deployed and they're in among the individuals who are suffering from this. They're seeing the same thing. But they haven't read this history and they haven't heard my talk. So uh, they say, we've got a new disease. And at the time, they were writing the DSM-3 uh, uh, text, which is the way in which you identify and diagnose psychiatric disease. Okay? So they go to the writers of the DSM-3 and they say, we've got this new disease, we want you to put it in the book. And they say, oh, it sounds very interesting, we'd be happy to do it, what do you want to call it? And so they say, well, let's call it Vietnam Syndrome. And the writers say, well, we don't like that term, it's not like Vietnam caused it. Uh, and we've also seen some cases like this of people that have never been to Vietnam. You know, they're Holocaust survivors and they're rape victims. And uh, so sit down and come up with a better term and we'll put it in the book. And that's what they did, of course. And as you may know, they came back with the term PTSD. And that is actually the history and derivation of PTSD, okay? And I think it gives you an important context in terms of the rest of the discussion. All right, so switching to today, we have large numbers of individuals coming back from deployment with all the symptomatology. And now we have MRI and imaging and all this good stuff. And if you do neuroimaging on individuals using the standard clinical neuroimaging techniques, you don't see anything. There's no reproducible abnormality in the brains of individuals who are suffering from this syndrome after blast exposure. Uh, and because of this, some people start to use the term invisible wound. In other words, to imply that there is some kind of damage, but we just can't see it, okay? However, because, whoop, ooh, wait, what the, sorry. Because we have a negative finding, this introduced the concept that the brains of individuals suffering from this were normal, okay? And because they were normal, undoubtedly they were stuff suffering from a mental health condition, okay? Um, now, MRI is a wonderful instrument and will show all kinds of things, but it doesn't have the resolution needed to see the brain at the cellular level. And so here are four different diseases that are defined by look, by neuropathologists like me, looking under the microscope and finding myriad numbers of lesions, okay, that define the disease, the basis upon which the diagnosis is made, whether it's diffuse cortical Lewy body disease, CTE, or Alzheimer's disease, or progressive supranuclear palsy, and all four of these examples, and I can give you others, 
have a normal MRI. Okay? So you can't use the, more, the MRI to say the brain is normal. Okay? It doesn't have sufficient sensitivity to pick out these microscopic lesions. Okay? Uh, and so this was part of the problem. A normal MRI does not mean the brain is free of pathology. Well, as, as you heard, uh, about 12 years ago, I was recruited to go to this military medical school called Uniformed Services University and set up a brain bank to start to study this. Okay? And Fortunately, I was given a fair bit of resources to do this. Uh, and this is the, what we now call the DOD USU Brain Tissue Repository. Uh, we're now in new space. In 2012, we moved into new space. It's a 8,000 square foot state-of-the-art laboratory. Okay. Uh, it's the only brain bank in the world dedicated to collection and study of specimens derived from military personnel. We don't do athletes. We don't do civilians. If an individual has served in the military, then that's fine. We'll collect, collect the brain, OK? Uh, so we accept brain donations from anyone who served in the military, active duty or uh, retired veteran population. Regardless of TBI history, we wanted to take all comers, uh, and that was an important decision. Uh, all manner of death, okay? We have four very experienced board-certified neuropathologists on our staff that evaluate these cases, okay? Each brain receives a very comprehensive workup, because we don't know what we're looking for. We're not trying to diagnose a disease. We're not just looking for CTE or for Alzheimer's disease. We don't know what we're going to find because nobody's ever looked. Okay, all right. And we store these specimens for use in research. And so, if a if a researcher from anywhere wants to come to us and say, "I want to study blast uh, this aspect of blast TBI." You've got the tissues. Can I get tissues? We're a bank, and we send them out, and we've actually shared tissues with over 40 different laboratories. It's a who's who of, of neuroscientists throughout the, mostly the United States, but some from overseas, uh, because we want the best science be being done on this very valuable material. Okay. Uh, this is the, the growth of the collection. Uh, we now have 400 and, I think as of today, 442 military brain specimens in this collection. It's amazing how it's grown. We're now getting two brains a week. All right. Uh, it's a very young collection. Uh, I, very early on, I said we're going to discourage taking brains from elderly veterans. Okay. What happens to the elderly veteran? is an important question. It's an interesting question. Somebody's going to need to answer that. But our mission was more, why were these people coming back from deployment from the Middle East and their families didn't recognize them? Uh, they were really completely messed up and there was a major suicide outbreak among them. We needed to explain that. We needed to, to study that. And so the collection is actually a very young collection. It's very unique in this way. Our mean age of death of these four, over 400 specimens is 48 years. Okay? Median is 49 years. So half of them are under 49. Okay? We've got 53 brains of people under 30. 120 brains of people under 40. Nobody's got that. I mean, it's really an amazing collection. Okay? But they've all served in the military. Okay? In terms of who they are, 10% uh, are special forces, Navy SEALs, Army Rangers, Green Berets, those sorts of things. Uh, a quarter have had a contact sport history. That's what you'd expect. It's who we recruit. recruit you know. uh, 
a fifth have had a significant civilian type TBI, an impact TBI, unrelated to sports, automobile accidents, fights, falls, that sort of thing. Uh, a third have known or reported blast exposure. Now, that's probably an underestimate. We get these histories from next of kin and from medical records, and many, many times it's not recorded. So it's probably higher than that, but we do the best we can. Okay? Uh, causes of death. A quarter of the cases of suicide. Over, we have over 100 military suicide brains in the collection. It's very unique. They're all consented for use and research. Uh, it's a very important part of the cohort, okay? 17% accidental deaths, and the rest are natural causes, okay? Uh, interestingly, 40% have at least one psychiatric diagnosis. The most common is PTSD, but depression and anxiety and other things are also included here. 41% have a history of alcohol and or substance abuse which really amazed us, but it's the background that's present within the military. Um, we got interested in brain tumors, particularly glioblastoma, because it is twice as common in the military uh, as in civilians, and when they get it, it tends to be of a young age. So we were able to collect these, and that was fine. Uh, I'll just mention, we take these cases from all over. Um, which is a major challenge, okay? We've collected brains from 33 states, many of them far away in rural, you know, collecting a brain in Alaska, Hawaii, Montana. This is not easy, okay? And it's expensive, okay? But we do it, all right? Uh, anyway, so initially there had been concern that the problem was CTE in the military. Okay, CTE is this disease that had been described in repeated impact TBI, primarily in the context of co contact sports, primarily football players. It's been a huge, you know, press about it, and everybody knows about it, and everybody's concerned about it, and, you know, if Johnny falls out of a tree and hits his head, is he going to get CTE, and, you know, all that stuff. Okay, and clinically, CTE looks very much like what I just described, the, the post-blast stuff, okay? All right, um, and it has a very specific pathology, okay? It has a, the accumulation of an abnormal protein called tau in very specific locations, uh, and once you've seen a few cases and you can recognize it, uh, um, it's not a hard diagnosis to make, okay? Uh, I had been, I had seen some of the initial NFL players. Uh, I had written several papers on this even before that. I knew this disease, okay? I knew how to diagnose it. I knew what it looked like, okay? Um, and uh, the other aspect of diagnosing CTE is if you have one lesion, well, uh, what is this? Uh, uh, if you have one lesion that fits the diagnosis, like this, you're diagnosed with CTE. Now that may be the only lesion in your brain. And so if you have one microscopic lesion, what does it mean? Probably doesn't mean anything clinically, okay? And a lot of the reports in terms of the frequency of CTE, particularly among contact sport athletes, is the adding up of a lot of cases with one lesion. And I'm not sure what that means. The implication is if that person had continued to live another 20 years, they would be riddled with lesions. We really don't have data to answer that question. Uh, but that's part of where this field is, okay? At any rate, uh, there have been reports that CTE was producing this syndrome in the military, okay? And it related to a report of a single case by Bennett Amalo, uh, as you see here, all right, and this is his case. Uh, and then four cases from the BU group under Dr. McKee, all right? Again, relating CTE to blast exposure. So we're talking about five cases. 
Now, who were these five cases? Okay? Based on those five cases, these were the kind of conclusions that were being stated. Okay? They've been demonstrated in the veterans, the mechanism involved uh, for at risk for development. Yeah. But supporting the concept that blast produced CTE. Okay. Now, when you read the fine print, you find that four of those five cases clearly had contact sport experience. The fifth, we don't know. Probably did as well, but we don't know, okay? But at least four had contact sport uh, experience. Uh, so on the basis of those five cases lumped together, there was a huge media announcement that CTE was rampant in the military, was a military disease. Okay? 60 Minutes, CNN, you name it. Okay? On the basis of those five cases. Uh, was that sufficient? Is that sufficient to answer this question? We said no. We felt that we were in a position to really address that question and started a, a study in which we would take the first 225 cases that we had received in the bank, look at them blind, and see how many of them fit the diagnosis of CTE, regardless of their exposure or anything, okay? We knew that within the group were a large number of Navy SEALs and people that had extensive blast exposure, and there were people that didn't have very much, okay? Well, let's take all comers, do it blind, Examine them very carefully. In fact, we sample, we oversampled the cases, looking for these lesions. Okay, and if they had one lesion, one little tiny microscopic lesion, we'd call it CTE. Okay, because that's what the field was doing at the time. Okay, um, we do a semi-structured interview with the next of kin to find out. Did they play football? Did they, did they do mixed martial arts? Did they, you know, all of that? We also looked in their obituaries. On, you know, with searching online, you can find the obituary of almost anybody that's died recently. And if you played football, even football in high school, it's gonna be mentioned. It's amazing, it really is. <laughs> anyway, so we use that as well, okay? Uh, and this is the data, okay? Basically, we found 10 cases of CTE of 225 cases, 4.4 percent, okay? Uh, two of them were in older individuals over 70, okay, but we included them. If you look at the number of lesions present, half of the cases had one lesion, okay? Just one. And a couple had a few more. But more importantly, when we broke the blind, we found that all of them, all 10, had a history of contact sport with this participation. All of them, okay? Uh, here it is, I'm sorry. All right, all of them. Now if we looked at blast exposure, there's only three. And we couldn't correlate blast exposure to the presence of CTE. We couldn't correlate the presence of CTE to other either functional uh, issues, suicide, suicidality, um, PTSD, all of those didn't correlate. Now, remember, only one, you know, half of them had only one lesion. I mean, it would be hard to convince anybody that that would produce anything, okay? Um, but there it was. So this is David Primer, who really led the study. It's published in the New England Journal. Pretty wide exposure, I must say, okay? Uh, um, and I think really changed uh, the whole ex uh, approach to this problem. Uh, we have now looked at 
over 400 of our cases and the data have not changed. We're about to, what we're going to do is we're going to do 450 cases, double what we had done, and report it again. I doubt New England Journal, that probably won't take it, but, but we're going to tell the world that, you know, it hasn't changed. Uh, so being on the battlefield is not like playing in the NFL. So it's not CTE, what is it? Okay. Uh, well, we're doing all this extensive work up on all these cases. And we found something that, uh, you know, I, I've been a neuropathologist for a fair number of years, and I've looked at a lot of brains so, over the years. And I found something in these brains that I had never seen before. That is, when we stain these brains for brain scarring, gliosis, astrocytes making gliofibrillary acidic protein, for those of you who work in this area, we found a pattern of GFAP staining that was at the gray-white matter junction, the subpeel area, and the penetrating blood vessels. And we called it interface astroglial scarring. And when we looked at these cases, they had all been extensively blast exposed. When we looked at individuals who had survived impact TBI, we didn't see it. Okay. And we proposed this as a blast-related lesion. Now, interestingly, I didn't know it at the time, but as I started to talk about this new disease, there were people in the audience who were biophysicists who had studied the biophysics of blast wave interaction with tissues. And they came up to me and they said, gee, we studied this in the heart and the lungs, and we found that the blast wave gives off its energy at areas where there's an interface between two different densities. Okay, That's where it gives off its energy. We never studied the brain because we thought it's too complex. Okay, But Seeing your work, this is exactly what we would, would predict you would find <clears throat> based on the biophysics, which is, you know, that was really nice to hear, okay? Um, we continue to see more cases since our initial publication. Um, following up on this, we decided to see if we could make an animal model for this. Okay, there's been a lot of blast work, experimental blast work, using mice and rats, okay? And we've spent a lot of money doing this, and nobody's ever showed interface astroglial scarring in a mouse or a rat. But the mouse brain and the rat brain, it's very small, and it doesn't have gyri and sulci, and more importantly, it doesn't have a good gray-white matter junction. We turn to the ferret. Ferret's a very interesting animal. It has beautiful sulci and gyri. It has a very nice gray white matter interface, and it's small enough to fit in our experimental blast tube, so we expose it to blast. That's the control. This is after four weeks, and we're beginning to see the interface scarring in the ferret, okay? And this, this work continues uh, with my colleague, uh, Sharon Giuliano. Uh, so we have a, an animal model of this. Next, we see the work of Adam Willis and, and colleagues, uh, and he's actually made a surrogate brain out of plastics that have the same physical configuration of gray matter and white matter and all of that. And so he's, he's, this is an artificial brain made out of plastics, and he's going to pass a blast wave through this. I'm not sure I can... Let's see if I can. Oh, yeah, maybe I can. Yes, I can. There we go. That's the blast wave. And now you're going to see in slow motion the distortion. And look at this. It's the great white matter junction. It's really amazing. It completely uh, replicates the, the pattern of damage that, that, that we're seeing. Okay? So, he takes this, okay, and says, okay, let's see what impact looks like. So 
So he's going to drop this here. See, it's coming down. And completely different pattern. It's focal. It has completely different physics. It's not gray white matter junction. It's completely different. Okay, and it actually fits the kind of pathology we see in impact TBI. So, I mean, we're moving along in terms of understanding sort of what's going on here. Now, recognizing that many of you are look at this issue from a perspective of mental health, I want to make sure I make the following points, okay? All right? Many of the behavioral issues of last exposed service members that they currently struggle with may not strictly be due to mental health problems, okay? Symptomatic last exposed service members diagnosed with PTSD may have distinctive microscopic brain abnormalities that can't be detected by traditional neuroimaging techniques, okay? And the presence of these brain lesions could contribute to both the neurologic and the behavioral symptoms exhibited by these patients, okay? Uh, and I strongly feel that the approaches to diagnosis and treatment of affected individuals now have to consider the presence and significance of these underlying brain lesions as well as the mental health issues, okay? I'm not saying that blast exposed service members cannot suffer from mental health issues. They clearly can and do. I'm also not claiming that non-biologic therapies for PTSD among blast exposed service members cannot be effective, okay? And I'd like to offer to you the analogy of the patient with cancer who develops depression. Very common combination, patients with cancer, the nature of the disease, the nature of the treatment, the prognosis, et cetera. Patients frequently will become depressed. It will interfere with the dealing with the problem. It will interfere with the acceptance of the, of the diagnosis as well as the treatment, et cetera, et cetera, okay? And it's perfectly indicated, in fact, it's, you know, it's clinical practice to approach the, the depression and treat it, okay? And very frequently it can be effectively treated and will allow the patient to accept the diagnosis and proceed with the treatment, etc. okay? But treating the depression is not gonna have any effect on the underlying cancer. And I think we have to look at this, this whole problem with this in mind, okay? It's not a binary thing. You either have a mental health problem or you have TBI, which has been the way this has been approached in many, many places. I'm not saying it's not here, but it does, does happen. You've seen it, okay? We've got to be much more inclusive in terms of the way we look at this problem and deal with it. Now, all right. Yep. Um, Oh, we can. <laughs> uh, I, can I go through this real quick? Okay. Sorry, you get me going on this. Okay. So where are we going? Where are we going with this? All right. The most important thing we need to do is to find a way to diagnose this in living people, not wait for them to die and come to my lab so I can look at the brain. Okay. Well, we can't do that yet. Okay. So I teamed up with the world-famous pioneers in developing new methods of imaging, okay? And these are the two guys, Peter Basser and Dan Benjamini. And they have developed something called multi-dimensional MRI. Not available at your downtown imaging center yet, okay? And they said, we think this may be the answer. And I gave them 14 pieces of tissue. Seven had interface astroglial scarring, and seven did not. But I gave it to them blind. I just said, here are the tissues. You go scan them, then send them back to me, and we'll look at them under the microscope. 
two months later, they call me up and they say, okay, we got seven that have it, we have seven that don't, and here are the pictures. Okay, so here's the pathology on at least three controls and three blasts. And you can see on the right upper part, that's the scarring. And they've done a heat map of where the scarring is. Uh, and the controls don't have it. These are sort of the typical MRI image you know, processing that people use. And you can't tell the difference. You can't tell which have it, which don't. They turn on the multi-dimensional MRI. Bingo. Amazing. It's completely superimposed on the pathology. They've nailed all, four, all seven. And this is great. Now, this is just on fixed tissue in the, in the magnet doing this. They are now, as we speak, taking clinical MRI instruments and reprogramming to do multidimensional MRI. And so we expect, we hope, within certainly a year that we may have something at the bedside that can diagnose this, which is really amazing. Really, you know, to come this far in this short period of time with a, di with a disease that no, no one knew, knew about uh, is it's really historic and remarkable. Okay, uh, let me just, this, uh, I've got to acknowledge, it, you know, I give the talks, but these guys do the work and all of that, and it's actually a much bigger team at this point now, but uh, these are amazing people who are very dedicated to, to all of this, and then we finally have to recognize the, the families who've donated to, because we couldn't do this work without them. Uh, this is our website, and if you go there, there are a whole bunch of really neat videos, including the amazing uh, 60 Minutes show that they did on us. Okay? And so why don't I stop there? Thank you, Dr. Pearl. I think you can see groundbreaking work. Thank you for your tremendous dedication and heart and soul for not being blinded, but what we didn't understand by just calling it something and being so yes. curious. Thank mm -hmm. you. So are, I'm gonna, are there questions in the audience? I do have one online that I'm going to start with, uh, which is, can astroglial scarring eventually form cancerous lesions? Oh, interesting question. Uh, as far as we know, no. Okay. These are not cancerous in nature. Uh, I mean, we really don't know what living with this lesion for 40 years will lead to. Okay, that's, uh, you know, I'm, I may not be able to answer that question. Maybe that my successors will. Uh, but as far as we know, we, we would not anticipate that this would lead to cancer. Okay. And then another one is, would neurovascular ratio scoring of the neurovascular coupling, and those were some of the pictures I was showing you, do you think be useful in determining these unique characteristics? Yeah, I mean, we're, we've become, this is not a simple problem, okay? And to just say, oh, it's that disease damp described inter interface astroglial scarring, end of story, Let's, we've, we've solved it. No, 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 no. This is a complex problem that's not going to have simple answers, okay? This is just the beginning. And we continue to study these brains, and as we continue to study these brains, we're finding very interesting changes in the blood vessels of these brains, okay? That shouldn't be there, that are most unusual. Uh, and they sort of look like the patient has hypertension. And when, you, when a patient has hypertension over the years, the blood vessels in the brain do change, and we know how to recognize that and all of that, except a, the patients don't have hypertension, and B, the distribution of these changes is not the way you see it when in a hypertensive patient. So we're not sure what's going on here, and we're very interested in the fact that when you study these patients when they're alive, their blood vessels and the control of the blood vessels and the blood flow through the brain is abnormal. And this may be the morphologic 
counterpart to that abnormality. So we're very interested in that. We're following up on it. Fantastic. Yeah. So now that you have this diagnosis, what's next? <laughs> Can we prevent it? OK. Well, we're all about prevention, diagnosis, and treatment. But now that we're beginning to understand the nature of the problem, we can begin to start to look at those issues of prevention and treatment. Okay? Without that, you're lost. You really are lost. Okay? We can begin to develop the experiments and the kinds of patients we need to study and even put together cohorts for therapeutic trials in a logical way particularly when they, we get that diagnostic piece in place, okay? So that's really key. That's coming. You can't put the cart before the horse, uh, uh, but we're on our way. You can see your way towards doing that, okay? Uh, is it going to happen tomorrow? No. This is, a, this is the way science is. It, it, you know, it's one step at a Maybe time. Maybe if you partner with us, we can start today. Absolutely. Oh, we can, we can start today. It's one we get... You know, get the answers, but absolutely, it's one of the reasons I'm so I mean, excited we need to be here. A brain health project for war fighters. Come absolutely. on, you're supposed to partner with me. Yeah, Man. we've got a question back here. My question was about treatment. Yes. Um, so you had talked about how when somebody has cancer, it can lead to depression, and so you would treat depression in one way, and then you would treat the cancer in a specific way. And right. So my question was about how you would. How, treat how treat it? Sure, sure. Well, a variety of, of ideas on that, okay? The first thing is, okay, we've got scarring in the brain, and that's obviously interfering with brain function. And scarring is the number one problem with spinal cord injury. When the spinal cord is severed by usually trauma, you get scarring that interferes with the reconnection of the spinal cord pathways, okay? We've known this for years. Civilian problem, okay? The spinal cord injury researchers have been studying pharmacologic approaches to interfere with scar formation for 20 years. Multiple treatment, therapeutic uh, trials and some successes, okay? We need to we need to tap into that, okay? Because now we know, we, we can visualize what's going on. It can, we can look at a much more rational approach to treatment. I'm not saying that's going to work, but at least we know what we're up against. We know what the enemy is, and I think that's where we, we have to go. We have some very interesting data in terms of, looks like a blast wave does damage astrocytes. And we're looking at the biology of astrocytes in particular as another measure in terms of how we could treat this. So, um, you know, we've got, we've got clues to follow up, a lot of work to do, but we're making progress. Okay? Thank you. That's a great question. Yeah. Well, my question follows on from that very much. And it's about what do we know about healing in the central nervous system? and the role of the, the immune system. And is there any reason for being optimistic that if you were able to take longitudinal scans from your multiple, yeah. uh, multi-dimensional MRI that you might see healing processes going on? Sure. This, this introduces the whole issue of neuroinflammation in this whole process. And there's been a lot of, in, there's been increasing in, interest in neuroinflammation and TBI, both civilian and blast. Um, and I think, our work is supporting that that concept. And actually, there was a slide that I didn't stop on, which was a PET scan study of neuroinflammation done in the reblast study at Harvard, where they're showing neuro, uh, PET scan evidence of neuroinflammation in the gray-white matter junction of affected Navy SEALs, OK? Uh, at using it primarily as a diagnostic tool, but it also implies that there's significant neuroinflammation taking place there. And so that opens up a whole spectrum of potential therapies. 
uh, that might be employed? Steve. Great question. In the spirit of what we could do tomorrow yeah. or today, given that, by the way, I was happy to see the Lycobiosystems Superior AT scanner. That was my prior life. Yes. Uh, so I'm glad you're making use of that. It's, it's a workhorse. We, we talked about what causes these. Is there, are there steps we could take tomorrow to start creating a cohort that maybe is exposed to less blast and start comparing outcomes from that cohort? Basically, when you look at this, you find that training regimens, uh, which is the one thing we can control. Once they get on the battlefield, no, I'm not, yeah, they're not gonna control it. But you certainly can control training. This had been looked at as trivial exposure, really, okay? And slowly, those people in the Pentagon who make those decisions are beginning to say, wait, 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 wait. Maybe, maybe we need to slow down a little. Maybe we need to back off in terms of the extent of exposure that is coming in these training exercises. And maybe even we need to slow down in terms of the repeated deployments and how extensive those are. It, this is this is something that was not seen. And it, it probably existed, but not to this degree, in special forces prior to uh, our uh, you know our experience in Iraq and Afghanistan. That really ratcheted it up. And once it ratcheted up, bingo, there it was, there it was. Okay. So I think we need to look at it that way. Uh, one thing I will I will say I meant to say is that. Warfare is changing, okay? Changing before our eyes. And if you want to see what modern warfare looks like, don't look at the videos of what happened in Iraq and Afghanistan. Look at today's newsreels in, in Ukraine and in Gaza. And this problem is shifting, not only from military to civilian, okay? The use of drones and targeted missiles is significantly exposing civilians to blast over pressure. And we're beginning to see the problem. Right. Dr. Pearl, thank you so much for really your tremendous work and what you're doing to change us. And we want to do the longitudinal study with you to show that we can maybe make an impact together. And your data will end up helping forming us in so many ways. One of the questions that goes along with Steve, the last one was online, is military leadership, how did they respond when you said this? You said the Pentagon. Is that, would you add anything to that about how military leadership is taking yours and have they stepped back and said, this is so important, we have to do X, Y, Z? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's happening slowly. It's happening, okay? They're listening, all right? At least some, some of them are, okay? Um, there is some pushback. Uh, there's no two ways about that, but uh, uh, it's, it's beginning to change, okay? Changing things in the military, I've learned, is not <laughs> straightforward, but there have been some real heroes in, the, in this progress. That's a good voice. Uh, uh, and I'm optimistic. Well, thank you, because we know our brains are our greatest weapons, and let's keep them safe and do everything we can. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Please join me. Fantastic. Good. I can hardly wait to report what we do together, Dr. Pearl, <laughs> because lifelong brain health is our shared mission, and you gave let's us... Let's do it together. Let's do it together. You've yeah. given us so many insights in different ways. I thought Dr. Ripma would ask some questions, because he's interested in that. He was quiet over there, uh, and I thought, I know you're going to meet with Mike Kilgard. I was interested in some of his questions, so we've got a lot of scientists that would love to pick your brain, I'm sure. Join us next time for our next Frontiers. It's next. The first got canceled, so we won't see you then, but we'll keep you posted. Do the tax challenge if you haven't done it, everyone. If you care about your brain, be sure to brain gain to see what seven days you can do and see how you can be better as you do it. We will see you very soon in the near future. Thank you again, Dr. Pearl. Join me again in a very rousing applause for him.